Hi everyone, just a quick video to go through the mechanism of the Swern oxidation and some of my thoughts as I go along. I'd also like to finish on my favourite trick that the Swern oxidation can do that other oxidation methods can't. Okay, so I've got my conditions here. I'm going to use the example of a primary alcohol being oxidised into an aldehyde, but this will also work for a secondary alcohol being oxidised into a ketone. My reagents are oxalyl chloride which has a structure like this. So it's kind of like a double acid chloride. This is a sort of activating agent in my reaction. My other key component is DMSO, which is normally used as a solvent, but I'm going to be able to use it as a reagent here. DMSO has this structure, but because there's a third row element bonded to a second row element there, the sulfur to the oxygen, um, it might be more useful for us to think about its resonance structure because the pi bonding is nowhere near as efficient as the sigma bonding. So I'm going to use this charge separated species in my mechanism for emphasis. Okay, so at minus 78 degrees, so that's using dry ice and acetone as a slush bath. So the first step of the mechanism will be this nucleophilic oxygen on the DMSO doing an addition elimination reaction on the acid chloride functional group and kicking out this chloride. That will generate this species. And if we have a look here, we actually have a very, very good leaving group. So the chloride anion is now attracted to the positively charged sulfur, and it's more than just a single leaving group here. Once we break this sulfur oxygen sigma bond, we can generate CO2, carbon monoxide, and the chloride. So the leaving group kind of falls to bits, which is one of the main reasons for it being driven forwards. And we generate one of the key intermediates in this mechanism, which is this chlorosulfonium species. So just to note what's been lost in that reaction, there's a loss of CO2 gas, there's a loss of carbon monoxide also as a gas, and there's a loss of a chloride. Okay, so we'd have left that reaction to stir for 15 minutes to form this reactive intermediate. And at that point, we put the alcohol into the reaction flask. So an oxygen lone pair on here will react with this very powerful electrophile like this to make a new sulfur oxygen bond onto our substrate. Now we'd also let this stir around for a little bit longer just to make sure we formed the key intermediate. And one of the things that's important here is that the hydrogens on the sulfur are actually quite acidic, more so than you'd expect, because if I were to remove that proton, I've got that positive charge to help me stabilize an anion. So my next step is to chuck in some triethylamine. So quite a weak base in the grand scheme of things, but it's enough to do this reaction that will be able to remove this proton. And I'm just going to draw this leaving the negative charge on that carbon. So using triphylamine is quite a smart choice as a base because it's reasonably bulky and it prevents any SN2 reaction at this site. Okay, so this species maybe looks a bit weird, but all this is is a sulfur-based illid. So you may be more familiar with illids in vitic chemistry, for example. Totally personal preference here, but you could always draw this as the resonance structure form up here. My personal preference is to use the negative charge because that represents the fact that we've got a third row and a second row element bonded to each other, so their pi bonding will, will likely be inefficient. Okay, and the final step of the reaction is to find the proton that's directly attached, and we can do an intramolecular hydrogen transfer. And in breaking that carbon-hydrogen bond, we form the carbon-oxygen double bond and dump the electrons on the sulfur flask. So our final product is the aldehyde that we wanted. And if we keep track of those arrows, the other thing that we've generated is dimethyl sulfide. So at this point in the mechanism, we've got slightly trickier reaction to do. So we need a little bit more activation energy. So what you tend to do is start this off at minus 78 degrees and warm it up to zero degrees. And at some point you'll get the transfer of the hydrogen atom. Now, this is always a word of caution whenever you do a Swern oxidation is that this is a very smelly compound. So all of your solvent waste and your glassware will be um, needed to be treated with bleach when you're working this up. Otherwise, your lab friends will not be happy with you. But otherwise, th there is a massive advantage of having this dimethyl sulfide because it's easy to remove and it's very volatile. And so purification of the aldehyde is quite easy for this reaction. And now for a cool trick that you can use the Swern oxidation for. And that's if you have a situation, something along the lines of what I've got drawn here, where you've got a 1,5 dial. So having both a secondary and a primary alcohol in here, depending on your choice of oxidant, you might not get the product you expect. For example, if I were to use, say, a Collins type oxidation, so using like chromium trioxide and pyridine or variants thereupon, you'd expect that mechanism to react faster at the primary alcohol, just purely on steric grounds, and that will get you the hydroxyaldehyde. Now the problem with this 1,5 setup is that this is very likely to cyclize just using the lone pairs that are on that um, secondary hydroxyl group. And this cyclized product, sometimes called a lactol, 
could be more stable than you'd expect due to the anomeric effect, but I'll leave that for another video to explain what that is. Now, the issue is here that you might not be able to isolate this lactol. There's still a hydrogen on there and your oxidation method of choice, say your chromium trioxide pyridine mix, that could easily oxidize up again to give you the lactone or this cyclic ester. Now that might be what you want and that's all good. But in other circumstances, you might want to turn your starting material into the 1,5 dicarbonyl species, which might be really useful for synthesis. And this is where the Swern oxidation comes to the rescue, because I can set up my activated electrophile here and attach it to each of the oxygens. So this step, if we left it long enough, would put sulfurs on both of these oxygens. So probably the primary one first on steric grounds, then the secondary one. So we wait around for a little bit for that to go. And then we chuck in our triophylamine to deprotonate at minus 78 degrees and warm it up. And we should get as a result the 1,5 dicarbonyl species for a future reaction step. Okay, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like, and I intend to follow this video up with other mechanism ones in the future.